We are up. All right. Hey, thanks, folks. My name is Phil Robb. Um, I'm the Senior Director of Technical Operations for Open Daylight. And I'm going to be talking to you about Open Daylight and collaborating with OpenStack. For those who don't know or haven't heard of Open Daylight, um, we are an SDN controller, an open source project that's part of the Linux Foundation. Um, as an SDN controller, we really want it to be uh, a common platform with a common set of code, uh, building a strong community so that we could have a, a, an industry-wide uh, collaboration in the networking industry uh, doing software-defined networking. Uh, to that extent, um, from a membership standpoint, you can see from this slide that we've got uh, pretty much most of the networking as well as um, uh, uh, computer manufacturers as part of uh, our collaborative. Uh, we've also started to get end users such as AT&T and Comcast. Uh, we've been around for three years. Uh, we launched in uh, April of 2013. Uh, we're now to the point where, uh, again, we've got end users who are actually putting things into production. Uh, to the extent that we've got uh, these different organizations that actually have products and services built on Open Daylight uh, that are in production today. In a nutshell, Open Daylight has about 32,000 commits, uh, 2.5 million lines of code, more than 700 developers at this point. Um, it's been around for, again, a while, so we're, uh, we're getting to the point of being mature and in production. Uh, as well as if you do a Kokomo study on the code base, it's looking like about 764 man years of effort. There's been a lot of activity in the networking uh, open source area over the last five years or so. Uh, open Daylight uh, is, by most different measures, uh, the largest. Uh, so we have a very healthy community, uh, very active, again, not too dissimilar from OpenStack. Around 150 known commercial deployments from 20 different companies, uh, and that spans software, equipment vendors, service providers, networking, entertainment, energy management, uh, and actual deployments. We do a, uh, a survey every year, and we just had our summit about a month ago at the end of September in Seattle. Uh, and part of that survey, we, we ask, you know, where are things being deployed by our users? Uh, and we're pretty well split between North America, Europe, and Asia uh, with regard to where uh, Open Daylight is being deployed. We also ask our users what they're using it for. Um, and around 20% it's, it's in new service creation, 27% in managing and monitoring their networks, 26% in actually doing traffic engineering, and about a third or 28% in NFV and cloud. Um, in recent years, last couple of years, the real intersection between Open Daylight and OpenStack has come uh, strongly in the network function virtualization space. Uh, if you were in the keynotes this morning, you saw uh, Ildika talk about um, what they've been doing um, with, uh, with uh, network function virtualization and the open platform for network function virtualization, or OPNFV. That's also where Open Daylight sees its largest intersection with OpenStack currently. So why do you care uh, as an open stack, or why does it really matter uh, if you've got open daylight? And the biggest thing is just with the size of the deployments that we're seeing, you know, we heard from China Mobile with their 10,000 instances uh, as they, uh, they got the super user award this morning. But the networks are just getting hugely complex. So being able to automate, being able to tell an external device, make my network do X for me and not have to worry about it further is really what we're trying to get to. And that's really the job of the controller. All right, so as we continue to build out these more complex environments, more automation, everybody knows, is needed, more analytics is, is needed so that you can actually feed the, the, the orchestration layer uh, so that everything can just be happening um, in an autonomous way, that's what Open Daylight is providing to OpenStack. And if we look at it from a layered perspective, you know, you've got your, your, your platform as a service, uh, software as a service, up at a layer, you've got the infrastructure, um, and from a networking standpoint, we're talking about network management, network orchestration, the actual controller, uh, being able to do analytics on that network, and then at the bottom, you've got the actual physical devices, right? So being able to have the applications just tell from an intent standpoint or a policy standpoint, I need this instantiated in my network, 
and have that actually done through an orchestration layer to the network, collect analytics off the network so that you can intelligently tell those applications again then how to manage and orchestrate and evolve that network's um, uh, uh, composite form you know, over time. That's really what we're trying to get to here. So the stack manages itself. Again, lots of activity in the open source networking space over the last few years. This is a, a slide that actually comes from the folks at the Open Platform for Network Function Virtualization uh, Project, or OPNFV. And it does a good job of just laying out now the options right, that are available from an application layer, things like Cloud Foundry, other platform as a service platforms. Uh, again, analytics, a project recently started called Panda, specifically uh, to do uh, large-scale analytics on your network. Orchestration has seen a lot of activity in the last month, or in the last year, rather, with uh, open source Mano, OpenO. Um, AT&T has announced that they're open sourcing an e-comp. Uh, that's supposed to come out uh, in open source somewhere in early 2017 from an orchestration standpoint. Again, from the virtual information management uh, platform space, OpenStack is by far the, the significant player there. Network control, again, open daylight. There's also Onos that focuses on OpenFlow specifically. Open Contrail focusing more on uh, MPLS. Linux dominates the operating system. Uh, OVS, DPDK, FDIO as, uh, as uh, items that are actually down in the data plane. Hardware specifically with Open Compute. And then OPNFV is really to try to put all of this together, create an installation environment and a test environment. So we look at it like you've got a variety of different views, different ways that you need to look at your network, right? And at the, at the top, there's really just the application view, right? I got one application that needs to talk to another. I want to talk to my platform as a service router and not have to worry about anything else, right? Policy is an important piece of network management as well, making sure that you've got users that are separated. Uh, you've got equipment that's separated. You've got different quality of service for different types of uh, the flows that you've got. Being able to manage that in a policy uh, uh, format and being able to view it from that uh, perspective is important. The service view, right? So you've got um, different endpoints that are sitting on different LANs that are connected through different WANs, through different data centers. You want to be able to see actually end to end what that looks like. And that sits on top of a virtual topology, usually in, in our virtual environments, such as OpenStack. Right? So there's a virtual network that sits on top of the physical network. And what makes up that physical network but the actual elements. Right? So you need to be able to understand those resources as well. Compute, memory, storage are pretty common. Bandwidth is also just as important. It's very influential on how your application is going to perform. Right? So better network management um, and visual be able to see that is really important. So being able to spin up those compute and those storage nodes without knowing how to connect them intelligently is a big problem. So again, kind of going back to the NFV uh, use case and, and what we're seeing, you know, OpenStack is really good with Neutron to be able to show the tenant-facing side of what your networking looks like. Right? Being able to see the physical environment, tie it to policy, tie it to service, um, and tie it to the actual physical network is what Open Daylight's there to help with. Uh, so for virtualization, for multi-tenancy, again, uh, network function virtualization telco services like service function chaining in particular, um, these are all important, again, as well as, as well as policy and intent. We've got different use cases from AT&T, China Mobile, Orange, as well as the Massachusetts Open Cloud as examples of this. So. Again, the most important benefit from Open Daylight to OpenStack is that you can see things end to end within the data center, across data centers, across the WAN, the virtual environment, and the physical uh, uh, infrastructure sitting underneath that. We're built in a very modular way to support many different types of protocols. We support many of the existing legacy protocols as well as the popular SDN protocols such as OpenFlow. And we're constructed to be able to support the new ones that are coming out as they come out. Um, being able to actually do the network monitoring, collecting the statistics, logging those off so that they can be looked at from a, some analytics engine or reacted to in real time is another key feature of the, of the controller. And we're built to integrate with those higher level orchestrators. And you're seeing 
again, in the NFV world, um, OpenO is specifically targeting being able to orchestrate virtual uh, machines that it's spinning up, as well as the connections and the service function chains that are created between them. So this is just an example stack, um, one of many, uh, that Open Daylight can perform, but this is focused on OpenFlow and OVSDB. Uh, inside of OpenStack Neutron, we have an ML2 driver, as well as uh, networking ODL as a, as a layer three plugin for doing uh, load balance as a service, firewall as a service, VPN as a service, and so forth. In Open Daylight, we have a, a module called Neutron Northbound. Because we have a variety of services that are potential, that are, uh, that are uh, available, um, to be used uh, for OpenStack's purposes. And so we wanted to create a common interface to OpenStack within Open Daylight, and then you plug into Open Daylight whatever of those services you're looking for, such as OVSDB Netvert, group-based policy, virtual tenant networking, uh, Lisp flow mapper, or the network intent composition project. From a southbound protocol, in this example, we're using OpenFlow, OVSDB, and NetConf. Another example is um, Fast Data Stacks. This is actually a project within OPNFV. Uh, again, Neutron and OpenStack at the top, talking through Neutron northbound to uh, the policy engine, one of the policy engines inside of Open Daylight called Group Based Policy. That then talks to the virtual packet processing renderer that talks through an interface that's NetConf and Yang uh, to Honeycomb agent uh, sitting inside of FDIO. And this is how you're actually managing uh, things that are built out of FDIO, be it a middle box uh, type of renderer or be it a switch itself. And then OPNFV has projects to both install with Apex as well as to test with Funk Test and uh, Yardstick that particular stack configuration. For more information on fast data stacks, again, that link down to the left, and I'll provide these slides later. Um, so if you want to go look at the architecture from the OPNFV site. What makes Open Daylight different? Um, when we started working on controllers and, and when SDN was brand new, it was, it was often thought of in layers, right? You had applications, then you had a core controller, and then you had network elements. Um, and that's really how we kind of started constructing our application. We had an application, we had a service abstraction layer that could then talk to protocol plugins so that you could have an application talk to different protocols depending on what your equipment was, right? But that ended up being really complex. Um, it was hard to add new applications. It was hard to add new protocols. So we changed and went with a model-driven approach. Um, so now what we do is we actually have you model what service or protocol you're going to implement in a model uh, that, that we use Yang for our modeling. Um, so you build a Yang model and then run it through a, a set of tools we call Yang tools. And outcome is a set of APIs that are auto-generated that then you write code behind to implement your service. And so if you're an application, you write this model, generate this tool. If you're a protocol, you write a model, run it through Yang tools, and generate the API for that. Um, then an application talks through that API um, to either an application or to the protocol. So it doesn't really matter um, if it's a protocol or if it's an application or a service. The interface is really the same, right? And the common glue between them is this Yang representation. Right, and we have that in both a common data store um, that all of the applications can access, and as well as through message bus, through RPC, through notifications, and so forth. And then we cluster that uh, so that you've got one logical instance that's actually spread across multiple physical instances for high availability and for uh, scalability. So you've got then producers of, of data and consumers of data. And those can be either internal applications or services within the controller or external. Um, so uh, they can be applications talking to the controller through a REST interface, or obviously they can be uh, network elements talking to the controller through a protocol plugin. Right? And it doesn't really matter where it is, in internal to the controller or external, the information is shared the same. We, uh, we list our. Um, our projects, or we, we release our project uh, down the periodic table. So we started with hydrogen, uh, then went to helium. Our most recent release in February was called beryllium. Um, and it, uh, in particular, had support for OpenStack full HA and clustering, as well as improved security for hardware VTEP using OpenFlow as opposed to just IP tables. 
Uh, also in that release, we had uh, OpenStack BGP VPN uh, support for the first time. And then our most recent release is Boron. All right, and Boron came out about six weeks ago. Uh, and in it, we continue, as always, to work on better scaling and better performance, uh, better HA and clustering. Uh, we continue to evolve the ML2 driver um, within uh, OpenStack. Uh, and we worked uh, on a project uh, to really do uh, application agnostic composition pipelining. So we run into an environment in, in uh, an SDN controller, particularly when, when using OpenFlow, where it's easy for an application, one application to step on what an another application is doing, send two different flows to a switch, and totally confuse the network, right? So having some way for applications to uniformly work with each other, uh, to know that they're not stepping on each other, was something we recognized we needed to do with an open daylight. Uh, and we'll end up doing this in a couple of different layers. We will most likely do this also in, the, in an intent layer as well. So again, just providing, provide an application providing intent to uh, the controller, and the controller then figuring out how to properly manage that pipeline. When not using intent, we still needed another, another way of doing that. And so we used a, a project called Genius was created for Boron, and it provides that interface. Um, and we have examples where, particularly with service function chaining, where we want different services to be able to know and work with each other. So they're passing things off um, and, and, again, interfacing with the switch, but they want to do it in a synergistic way as opposed to a mutually exclusive way. Um, and Genius provides that for them as well. Um, we started a project called Netvert that's actually a spin out from the OVSDB project, really focused, again, on providing network virtualization services to OpenStack. And then a new project was started called Yang IDE. Uh, and this was actually brought by folks from AT&T. Uh, if you've studied AT&T and their domain two activity, they're really focused on Yang as a modeling language that they want to use for a lot of different things in their network uh, environment. And so they wanted to be able to have a tool that would actually build Yang models and put it into Eclipse. Uh, and so that's actually what Yang IDE is. It's a tool to build Yang models, syntactically check them, visually uh, be able to represent what that Yang model so that it's easy to see, uh, put it into Eclipse. And since Open Daylight is probably one of the largest applications using Yang today, that's where they decided to house it, was within Open Daylight. Uh, with Boron also, we had another southbound protocol plugin called OCP that was added. And it's done for controlling and managing radio, uh, remote radio head equipment. Um, and then Cardinal is another interesting project that was done. Um, and it, uh, it actually allows open daylight to be uh, monitored and managed from traditional network management systems. So it has a set of SNMP MIBs, uh, as well as, uh, and will also generate traps uh, to talk to a network management system, providing all the information that open daylight can see to all of the different network elements that it's actually managing. So we have a project within Open Daylight uh, called uh, Time Series Data Repository, or TSDR, um, as well as Sentinel that's specifically looking at that type of data for streaming uh, workloads. And information from both of those projects actually feed through Cardinal to a uh, network management system as well, so to integrate with your existing uh, network management system. Um, to get started, come to opendaylight.org. Another big thing that we did that was sorely needed um, in our project, uh, not too uncommon to, to open stackers as well, was our documentation was pretty horrid. Um, we made a very large step in this latest release. All of our documentation is now part of read the docs. Uh, it's, it's uniform. It's, it's cleaned up much nicely. Um, and because we just had our summit, um, we record everything in our summits as well. So we've got uh, just hours and hours of recordings on our YouTube channel, Open Daylight Project uh, on YouTube. Uh, again, these are all now only four weeks old, so now's the time to go take a look at them. There's many different sessions that are on OpenStack and Open Daylight integration. Uh, I strongly encourage you to go there to take a look, um, as well as full day tutorials on how to do integration of OpenStack and Open Daylight at a very low level. Um, so lots of hands-on uh, and lots of good recorded material there for you. Um, again, uh, open, uh, opendaylight.org slash start to uh, get started. And with that, uh, I, I greatly appreciate your attention. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>